Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 5th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we focus on the top three fiscal issues that will face the new governor and legislature, regardless of who is elected. They are these. First, how much do we spend? Second, how do we pay for it? And third, what happens to the PFD in the process? And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, baby. All of it. That's what he does. Brad Keithley joins us every week. Today is no different. It is Election Day. And the only thing different about that is he's going to pay, play a big game of kind of what if... And uh, that that's kind of that's kind of where we sit this morning. Uh, you know, what are we going to spend? How are we going to pay for it? And what happens to the PFD? These are all, again, kind of what if scenarios. Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets joins us now. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Michael. How uh, how's your morning going so far? <laughs> You're in Ireland. Just go find um, Murphy and cook him. You know, kick him right in the kahoolies. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's uh it's it's it's, it, it's okay we're gonna make it through we're we're doing well on radio so that's all that matters at this point um election day brad now i know you voted obviously because you're still on your music junket uh, around the world but um you know the the rest of us working stiffs are just kind of getting out there trying to uh you know we're going to get our our last minute kicks in here and get it done um let's talk a little bit about you know what happens where, where does it go from here and those top three issues, you know, how much are we going to spend? How are we going to pay for it? And what happens to the PFD? Well, I think uh, today's sort of the beginning of the uh, of, of what happens with the rest of the story. People are voting today. They've largely made up their minds, I would suspect. Uh, we're going to find out this evening or tomorrow morning uh, uh, how that came out. But sort of regardless of, of which candidate for governor and which set of representatives uh, were, uh, that we find out that are going to represent us or go, are going to be in the government, um, we've, got, we've got big issues that are coming ahead of us uh, that are going to face the next set of government. And that, that, those set of issues aren't going to change uh, depending upon who gets, gets elected, uh, whether it's a Dunleavy or Begich. Uh, and whether it's the R's in the Senate or the D's or the R's in the House or the D's, uh, they're going to face uh, some significant issues. And and, I, and from my perspective, I've started looking ahead and, and seeing what seeing how bad those issues are, and started you know thinking through how we're going to address those issues because they're going to be tough. Right, they're going to be tough. Yeah. Well, and and I I think you're 100 percent right. I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, in some ways, these candidates have started to sound a lot of like in kind of the general thrust and the direction they're going. Now, some of the details are different uh, and there are some other I mean, you know, but but the general thrust seems to be kind of running in the same direction, you know, trying to fully fund the PFD, trying to work on some of these crimes, trying to do these things. So, I mean, the 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 devil's in the details, but really it's going to affect us regardless who ends up being governor. They are. And and the big issue, I think, uh, the, the starting issue uh, that we're all going to come back to uh, uh, once we sort of sort through who's in government is how much are we going to spend? Uh, 
uh, uh, this coming year. You, you would think that we would start with how much do we have to spend and then proceed to how much are we going to spend. But that's not seemed to be the way that, uh, that it's worked uh, over the last few years. And, and we, start, we start with, a, with some big numbers. I mean, when you look at FY uh, uh, 2019, the year we're in right now, the year we're almost halfway through, right. um, we're, we've got a budget of about $4.7 billion. It's a little bit more if you count the supplementals. It gets up to about 4.8. If you count the supplementals, it's a little bit less. Um, about 4.65. Sort of cutting through the through the middle, we've got a budget of about 4.7 billion dollars for FY 2019, and the Legislative Finance Division uh, has already told us uh, that it's going to take 200 million more just to sort of stand in place uh, to to account for uh, inflation and uh, and 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 that sort of thing, uh, the commitments that are coming up that have been deferred from prior years, 200 million more to just sort of stand in place. So you can get to 4.9 billion or 5 billion uh, as a starting point for for fiscal year 2020 um, fairly rapidly. That's a big number, uh, especially when you start comparing it to the revenue we're going to have. But you know, 5 billion dollars is is uh, as a starting point is is a lot of money. Uh, for, for from the perspective of unrestricted general fund, Mike Dunleavy talked about cutting that back. Uh, Mark Begich has talked less about cutting it back, although he's talked some about that. Uh, but that's sort of the starting point we're, we're faced with. Both candidates will tell you that um, that they're not re- that that you know they they envision numbers different from that. But that's the number you start with. So when you start talking about what our what's our budget going to be. Uh, and start talking about budget cuts. Uh, that's the level that that you're starting to. That's the level you're going to have to deal with. Now, when you, I mean, we talk about you know how much are we going to spend? Uh, you know, some people will be like, well, we've already spent more this year. I mean, why does it matter? I mean, if we're going to spend, you know, we're, we're it's always going to be we're going to do it. It's government; it can't go broke. I mean, you know, all these ideas that people seem to have that, I mean, you and I are you know understand to not necessarily be the truth. Um, and and it, and all it does is either it will cause something painful immediately, or worse yet, it will continue to kick that can down the road, and all of a sudden your children will be burdened with something. Yeah, we. I mean, people talk about uh, making cuts, but we've had and and they've talked about Governor Walker, you know, not making cuts and 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 you know, blaming him for that. But we've had an Alaska Senate, a Republican Senate. Uh, for the last, um, well, uh, since 2012, since right. the, since the uh, the bipartisan uh, uh, Senate was was uh, replaced with a Republican Senate, we've had a Republican Senate now for the last uh, six years. They, the first two years of that was with a Republican governor. The last four years of that has been with a, with an independent governor. But you can't a governor can't add money to the budget. I mean, he can only spend as much. Uh, as the legislature appropriates, uh, and while the Alaska Senate has talked a good game uh, about <laughs> cutting the budget, uh, they've never followed through with it. Right, right. So when 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 people start by saying, "Well, that's just too much. We need to cut back," uh, you know, why do we need to start with that number? The reality has been that even though everybody's talked about cutting, even though everybody's talked about you know finding fixes here and there. Uh, when the legislature has gone through the process, even when the Senate has gone through the process of, of looking at the budget, breaking down into subcommittees, rolling those subcommittees up uh, into the overall committee, uh, finance committee, and then, uh, and then putting a bill out on the floor, uh, they haven't made uh, significant cuts uh, in, in that spending level. So that's, that's – we, we've sort of put ourselves um, uh, in this hole. We've created – uh, the university system that we have, we've created K through 12 funding, the formula funding that we have, we've created the Medicaid situation that we have, Medicaid expansion added to it. But even before Medicaid expansion, we had opted into virtually every optional Medicaid service uh, that the federal government said that they would help pay for uh, and build up roughly a $700 million Medicaid system, half of which 
uh, was optional. It's about 350 million of which was optional. So th- this is this is the this is the government that we've uh, that we've given ourselves, and and when even when we've said we've got to cut it, we've got to find ways uh, to get the operating budget down. We've got to find ways to have a smaller government. We just haven't done it. Right. Absolutely. So how much are we going to spend? That was question number one. So um, how much do you think we are going to spend? And what are the numbers that the two campaigns are talking about? Are we going to hit your magical number? So I, what we need to spend to have a, to have a balanced budget, um, and, and by a balanced budget, I mean a budget where current revenues match current expenditures, um, taking into account the need to start refilling the CBR, which we've talked about on previous programs. What we really need to spend is about three, can afford to spend, is about $3.75 billion. Well below, a billion and a half, a uh, billion and a quarter uh, below where the starting point is that uh, that, that the numbers uh, tell us where we're starting. Dunleavy's talked about a $4.3 billion operating budget. Uh, you have to add capital onto that, uh, and capital gets you to about $4.45 uh, billion. Uh, that's tough to even get to that number. Right. Uh, and Begich has talked about – Begich hasn't really talked about a specific number, uh, but he's but he's more or less uh, talked about the general area where we are uh, now, maybe making some – uh, cuts where you can find efficiencies, but he's not really talked about making major cuts, and he hasn't put out uh, a number that is that is different than uh, than the current budget number. And at least Mike Dunleavy's done that with the four point four point three billion. But we're talking about we're talking about a starting point, the five billion dollar level. When you add in the two hundred million, just to sort of hold constant, we're talking about a, a starting level that's just significantly higher than. Than uh, than any of those any of those budget numbers, and frankly, significantly higher uh, than the revenue number that that we can expect for uh, FY uh, 2020. All right, so we know that they're probably not going to hit the magical number that would refill the CVR and do pull all the levers that we need to have pulled to really bring the government back on track. Part of it's due to lack of a plan. Part of it's due to just probably lack of political will. Uh, so the bottom line is on number two. How are we going to pay for it all? Well, that's that's going to be the twenty thousand dollar question next year um, <laughs> per person. So, that's the twenty thousand dollar per person yeah. question next year. Yeah, probably twenty twenty million twenty billion dollars. No, <laughs> um, but it's it's uh, we've got it. We've got. I mean, the best estimates that I've seen, the most the most aggressive estimates, the the sort of the you know oil stays up. In the mid 70s, uh, uh, trending up, production stays uh, fairly high, um, and sort of the best case scenario that you can come up with this, come up with on the revenue side. Uh, most people are talking about 3.1 billion dollars right. um, from traditional revenue sources. That's from uh, uh, oil revenues, traditional oil revenues, uh, plus um, uh, other taxes that are about a half a billion dollars that. Uh, uh, that we uh, historically have had, so that's about 3.1 billion dollars. And then you start looking at Hammond 5050. You start looking at either the Dunleavy plan uh, that uh, pays a full dividend, uh, or you start t- looking at the Begich uh, uh, plan that uh, uses the uh, uh, POMV draw, the percent of market value draw, and then divides that Hammond 50 that that into 5050 uses Hammond 5050 on on that amount. Um, and those those numbers uh, help. Uh, so if you have a starting point of three point one billion dollars, uh, uh, applying paying the full statutory PFD uh, within the confines of the five percent uh, draw that the legislature passed last legislature SB twenty six, which is a statute on the books and limits the amount that can be taken from the earnings reserve account. That adds about another $800 million. The, the, the share that would go to government uh, after paying the full, full, full PFD out of that POMV draw uh, would give you about $800 million. So you're up to about $3.9 billion at that point. Uh, Begich's plan actually gives you a little bit more uh, because the Dunleavy plan is constrained by uh, the, the, the 5% POMV draw, so you're not getting a full 50% in 
after you pay the uh, full PFD under the Dunleavy plan, Begich probably gives you about a billion two um, uh, under his plan. Um, so that adds to the 3.1, that gets you to about 4.3. Those numbers start getting you in a range that you think, okay, the problem's not that horrible. But the problem is with those, those numbers are sort of the high water mark. You then right. need to take out of that the, oblig- the, the, the commitment to start repaying the CBR um, in some amount. Uh, and so that pulls both those numbers back down uh, somewhere in the, uh, in the 3 billion range. <laughs> Excuse me. So you're in, a, you're in a situation where you've got a spending level, you know, sort of the status quo spending level of $5 billion. And you've got a, 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 a revenue level of somewhere in the high three billion dollars after you pull um, uh, after you pull the CBR amounts out, or better put, sort of the medium uh, three billion dollar level after you pull those CBR b- amounts about. So you've got you've got a gap uh, in there of about a billion and a half, a billion and a quarter to a billion and a half uh, that. Uh, uh, that we're that we're going into the legislature knowing that uh, knowing that we're dealing with yeah and of course that that it has not seemed to dissuade them at any time from from doing anything that they've been doing that that's that's part of the problem we're going to continue with brad keithley here in just a minute alaskans for sustainable budgets we're working on number two of his weekly top three this is the election edition how much are we spending how do we pay for it and what does it do to your pfd in the long run, regardless of who you vote for. These are problems facing both sides. We return with Brad Keithley right after this. We are in the break uh, right now. Brad Keithley still continues with us as our guest. Um, Brad, when you look at this and you see, uh, well, first of all, how much is, what is the requirement for the CBR payback? Remind me, because God, it's been years since I looked at it. So the CBR is, um, CBR is, says that it requires that any funds not appropriated, any revenues, current revenues not appropriated, go back um, uh, into the CBR when you had a, a borrowing from the CBR, um, and that those revenues go back into the CBR. So it's sort of open-ended. But here's here's the deal with the CBR. We have drained out. We, we have survived on the, over the last five years by pulling down uh, our fiscal reserves. We've pulled down... Twenty billion dollars, right, to survive over the last five years. Twelve billion of that uh, has come from the CBR, and we we virtually capped out everything. We we capped out the the statutory budget reserve early on. Uh, that was about four billion dollars at, at at one time, uh, and then we started pulling down the CBR, and we pulled down twelve billion dollars from the CBR, and then we pulled down. Uh, roughly another four billion dollars, three to four billion dollars through PFD cuts, using the PFD uh, essentially as as a fiscal reserve. So that adds up to twenty billion dollars, and we're pretty well tapped out. I mean, we don't have the SBR is basically gone. The CBR is down to less than two billion dollars, um, and you know we're running into we're, we're making PFD cuts, which both candidates have said essentially they want to stop. So we need to build. And, and, and we're looking at a national economy that, that a lot of economists say is going to start running into a rough patch uh, in the early 2020s. So we're, we're looking at, you know, being on the cusp of hitting another uh, rough patch from an economic standpoint. It's not certain that oil prices are going to stay at the levels they've gone back to. Uh, there's, there's some softness in demand. So we're looking at the potential for another rough patch. We need to get the CBR filled back up or start filling the CBR back up, certainly while we're having these sort of higher oil prices than we've experienced in the last few years. If we don't do that, the next time we hit a rough patch, if we haven't filled the CBR back up, the next time we hit a rough patch, we're not going to have these fiscal reserves that we've lived on off the last five years to help us get through the next rough patch. And the only place to go, left to go, if we don't fill the CBR back up, is to the permanent fund earnings reserve. And there, if we start pulling that down, you're just eating your seed corn. Right. Because that's part that's part of what we have invested through the permanent fund that's generating permanent fund earnings. If you start pulling money out of the permanent fund earnings reserve, uh, what you're going to have is a future with lower 
uh, permanent fund balances, and as a result, lower permanent fund earnings. So you're going to have a lower contribution to government, and you're going to have a lower PFD as you started consuming uh, your investment base. So the, the way the way you avoid that, the way you avoid putting yourself in a position where you have to start consuming your seed corn, is to build the CDR back up. Um, and it's it, the way you do that is you spend less uh, <laughs> than your revenues, and that difference goes back into the CBR. The way the way you sh- we should plan for that is to say, okay, we're gonna over the next ten years, we're gonna fill that twelve billion dollars back up. We're gonna pay off what we borrowed from the CBR, and that's an average of a billion two uh, each year. I mean, that sounds like a staggering amount, but that's how much we borrowed. We borrowed twelve billion dollars. Um, what we should do is plan for that. You can you can fudge that somewhat, but you can't ignore rebuilding the CBR because if we do, the, the, the generation that's going to get stuck with the next downturn um, is, is going to get stuck without the, without the fiscal reserves to be able to manage it. And as we think we've had it bad the last five years, it's going to be horrible. Um, uh, the next time we hit this, if we don't have the CPR bill back up. Well, let me ask this. You then, let me ask you this then, Brad. Um, is there pol- is there the political will to do what we're talking about? Probably, uh, probably not. Uh, and that's going to be that's going to be the when we come back on air. That's going to be the next question. Well, we've got this gap, um, and how are we going to deal with it? Right. Um, and and frankly, one of the answers to that, and it, this is this is an answer that both Dunleavy and Begich are, are either Dunleavy or Begich, and and whatever legislature we have are, are, are going to confront. We have too high a spending. We can't. We haven't found the will to get the spending down. We've run through our fiscal reserves. Revenues aren't going to match uh, spending levels, um, and so we're going to have to start talking about taxes. Uh, there, there's, there's, there's really no way around that. Welcome back. We're just having some inf- uh, interesting conversations with Brad Keithley in the chat room, uh, Facebook. You can find it at facebook.com slash Michael Duke Show if you'd like to be uh, with us on the behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, right before we uh, came back, uh, Brad has been talking about some of the conditions. He's been talking about some of the specifics about how the CBR works. And then I asked this one question, and he answered it, but I'm going to ask him to to answer it again because I think it's important to know. So, Brad, here's the question yet one more time. Is there the political will to do what we're talking about, to put money in the CBR, to cut back on our spending, to create that sustainable level of, uh, you know, $3.7 billion to still have money for future, you know, to do what we need to do. Is there the political will amongst any of the candidates, the legislature, all that? Is there the political will to get it done? Michael, I don't think so. The, 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 the spending level that we talked about earlier, about $5 billion, once you adjust current spending for, for the sort of true up for inflation and everything else and start talking about a FY2020 budget, that $5 billion, people have talked, the Senate has talked about bringing that number down, bringing the, the base operating budget down, but they have not, even the Senate uh, has not mustered the political will to, to really fight for that. Uh, Mike Dunleavy um, has, has uh, who, who going into this campaign, I thought was going to have, was going to be able to find a campaign saying, look, We've, we've faced hard times. We're still fail- facing hard times. We're going to have to get our spending down. At the, be- at the end of the primary campaign, the beginning of the general campaign, Dunleavy started talking about a $4.3 billion budget, which is, which is still way too high. It's not $5 billion, but it's still way too high compared to, uh, compared to uh, the, the type of revenues that we're going to have. Um, so you're really I, – I, the political will may be there to make some cuts. Uh, frankly, that would be even that's going to be surprising, uh, given what's happened over the last uh, uh, four years as we've been in this fiscal mess. Uh, there's there's no more capital budget to cut, uh, and we've seemed to stall out uh, in making operating budget cuts. This the the FY 2019 budget's higher. Uh, even on the operating budget side than the FY 2018 budget. So we've actually started building back up. And when people have talked about making cuts to K-12, making cuts to Medicaid, making cuts to the university, 
all three of which have to have significant cuts in order to make progress in cutting that five point that five billion down. There hasn't been the political will to do that. So, no, I don't. I don't. I don't see the political will to deal with it to deal with this issue uh, on the spending side. And by the same token, I don't see the revenues uh, there, as we were talking about before the break and during the break, I don't see the revenues there to support a $5 billion budget. So we're we're running into uh, a situation where we've sort of created this gap and it's becoming a permanent gap. And we've run through all of the fiscal reserves and trying to, you know, shore up the dike in the meantime. We're now all the way through them, and I think we're hitting the next phase uh, of how this uh, how this fiscal situation plays out when we come into the FY 2020 budget. Well, and, and of course, this is the bad news that nobody wanted is that, you know, it doesn't seem like anybody is uh, willing to really make those hard choices. We have high hopes in Mike Dunleavy, but again, he hedged. Uh, and when he could have, uh, you know, gone, you know, full fledged, you know, gone, gone for the jugular, so to speak. So, uh, it, you know, we're a little concerned. Uh, I think for a lot of us, it doesn't mean we're not going to vote for him, but it would have made it a lot easier if he had stuck with that kind of tougher tone on budgets and everything else. But where does that leave us, Brad? That leaves us to number three, which is, of course, what happens to the PFD when we talk about how much we're going to spend and how we're, it's going to be paid for. So the question in the long run is, what happens to the PFD then? Well, I think, I think here's where we're going to be as we get into the FY2020 session. Spending cuts, people are going to talk about them. They're not going to make them. Revenues aren't going to get there. Um, and so we're going to have to have new revenues. We're, we're in, and that's going to lead to one of three things. The first thing to go is refilling the CBR. I mean, some we're gonna we're gonna tell ourselves, or government's gonna tell itself, well, we don't need to refill the CBR yet. We'll be fine. Uh, we can go another year without filling it up. So that that gets you back some money, some some revenues that otherwise ought to go to the CBR should be going to the CBR, uh, won't be going to the CBR. Then the next thing they'll tell themselves is um, is we're gonna you know we're gonna use some some remaining amount of these few fiscal reserves we have uh, to, to fill the gap. The problem is there isn't much left in terms of fiscal reserves. There's a little under $2 billion left in the CBR. We ought to be filling the CBR back up. But there's going to be discussion about pulling, pulling some of those reserves out of the CBR, and that maybe gets us another year uh, uh, if we do that. Um, but at some point, we're going to have to be talking about and, and this year, likely, even if we pull some out of the CBR, we're going to have to be talking about some additional new revenues. And that's going to reignite or ignite the, the PFD versus taxes uh, debate. <clears throat> some are going to go, some are going to say, no, we need to be c- continuing to pull the PFD down. Even though we have two gubernatorial candidates who have talked about preserving the PFD, you've got your real, we're going to be electing people like Chris Birch. Uh, in the Senate, who, and, and we already have Natasha von Inhofe in the Senate, both of whom have talked about draining the CBR before they, or draining PFDs before they ever talk about uh, doing taxes. So we're going to have, we're going to have, it, notwithstanding what we've had in this general election, all the good things that have been said in this general election about the PFD, we're going to have a debate in this coming legislature about whether we cut the PFD or whether we have taxes. Yeah, I and and I think that that's not a, that's not a uh, a discussion that anybody really wants to have. And of course, the Senate so far has framed that argument in their favor. Oh, hey, we protected you from the income tax, and we had to we had to cut the PFD. We are ch- profiles in courage for cutting the PFD um, because otherwise, you guys would have been faced with an income tax. And of course, what they don't tell you is that. Of course, the cutting of the PFD is a tax, and in fact, it cuts deeper into the lowest 80% income earners while protecting the highest top 20% income earners uh, from any kind of substantive uh, uh, amount. And uh, and it's just, I mean, it's just, it's a trade-off. And of course, if you go the other way to an income tax, a standard kind of progressive income tax, it flips the tables the other direction, not quite as badly skewed, but flips it the other direction, which again leaves the question that we have of, you know, flat tax or what, I mean, at this point, if we can't get our spending under control, we're going to have to have some form of tax or revenue. 
We are. Uh, and that's and that's really where we've sort of stumbled to. I mean, we, we, we've not had the political will to make the cuts. People have talked about the cuts, you know, incessantly for the last four years. We haven't mustered the political will to do it. And, and even Dunleavy, when we got to the campaign, blinked uh, on making the type of cuts, the, the, the depth of cuts that need to be made uh, in order to in order to restore uh, Alaska's fiscal structure. So um, we're going to be talking about that. Here, here is where I think the important issue is, and, and for people who are still making their up, minds up on Election Day, what I think should drive them, certainly what drives me. The PFD ought to be taken off the table before we start into these discussions. As Governor Hammond has said, um, it, it's intended uh, as to fulfill the constitutional uh, 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 vision of every Alaskan getting a benefit from the state's resources, individual benefit from the state's resources, that it's not government's money. The PFD is not intended to be government's money. That it's intended to be the people's money and that we ought to preserve, the, that the PFD needs to be preserved uh, and set aside. We, we, we need to have people that, that will set that will take the PFD off the table, not be talking about it as a revenue source, as a fiscal reserve uh, to be used to help uh, balance the budget uh, in times like this when we can't get spending under control and, and revenues aren't matching spending. Um, and, and taking the PFD off the table, I think, will frankly help uh, help the, uh, the controlling spending discussion because if you don't have the PFD as a backstop. If you can't, if the top 20% can't tap the PFD as a, as a fiscal reserve to help uh, continue funding government spending, then we're going to have to confront, confront taxes. Um, and once we're confronting taxes, once people are really going to sit there and say, yep, we're going to have to pay a tax for government spending, my belief is that people will start spending, will start paying more attention uh, to spending yep. than they have than they have in the past. Yep. And and it, that and that the force to control spending will really come from the the people who are being confronted with the with the potential of having to pay actually finally having to pay taxes, real taxes. All right, all right. Um, uh, Brad, to, to pay for government. Give us our final thoughts here. I think I think the most important issue to go out and vote on is the PFT. I think if if, if people are still undecided that that they ought to look at their whole card, they'll look at candidates who are going to support the PFD, uh, take care and protect the PFD, um, uh, and and vote for those can- that are going to take the PFD off the table um, and support those candidates. Um, I don't think we're going to get, frankly, Michael. I don't think we're going to get to spending cuts any other way until people are confronted with the need to pay taxes to support uh, high government spending, elevated government spending, until they're confronted with that reality, I don't think they're going to get behind uh, spending cuts. I mean, you look at von Inhofe, you look at, you look at Birch, you look at Giesel, you look, you look through the Senate Republicans, John Coghill, they, as I say, they talk a good game, but they haven't made those cuts. And when push came to shove, they, they shoved it off on the PFD and said, well, we're actually going to cut. You know, the, the, uh, an important income stream to 80 percent of the Alaska population uh, rather than make uh, cuts to spending. Yeah. I don't think until you confront those people and their constituents with actual taxes uh, for uh, uh, to support these spending levels, I don't think we're going to get to the spending cuts. So the, the most important thing to me is for people to go out and, and who believe in the PFD to vote for candidates who are going to support the PFD. And then we'll come back and we'll start dealing with the budget issues once we have that taken off the table. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board and talking with us this morning. We appreciate you being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.